Imagine it's the year 2044, and President for Life of the People's Democratic Republic of America, Bio-Biden, gets word that his farm collectivization initiative isn't exactly doing so well, and that a famine has started in the state of Oklahoma, which he had given the highest farm quotas due to their poll numbers showing a strong dislike for him. Then, instead of sending meaningful aid to the starving Oklahomans, he locks down their borders, increased their quotas, had the military take what little food they had left, often straight from the arms of people starving to death, and then, as millions of Oklahomans died, he had the people's mass media report the lie that there was no famine in Oklahoma, and anyone who dared speak otherwise to let out what was going on was to be severely punished. Then, a hundred years later, Long after the inevitable economic collapse of the PDRA, a new generation of communist sympathizers, sure that their insane system would surely work this time, decide to downplay the event by screaming the apologia, You can't prove that Bio-Biden knew that locking down and stealing food from starving people would kill them, therefore it wasn't a genocide. Sounds like a pretty crazy dystopian future novel, right? Well, what if I told you that something very similar to this scenario has already happened. So yeah, hey there internets. So one of the more ridiculous topics out there that political news and philosophical channels like my own have to occasionally cover is the unfortunate topic of genocide denial and those who partake in it just generally being wrong. So in this video, I'm going to be going over the Holodomor and explain why it was indeed a genocide and refuting many of the claims to the contrary. And as you will find out, the silly story I just told about Bio-Biden and a future communist dystopia starving Oklahomans out very eerily mirrors events that happened in Ukraine under Stalin, and the utter insanity of how the Holodomor is often discussed in the modern day. Now, there are many, many other videos on this subject. A lot of people have talked about the Holodomor. There's a particularly good one out there that comes from Casual Historian's video on the Conspiracy of Silence, which is a much longer video than this that goes more in-depth on the historical context side on the what's and why's of the Holodomor. The main difference between my video and the other ones is that this video will be more focused on refuting the various arguments that people give for denying the Holodomor, or otherwise trying to downplay it in ways that either go against the historical evidence or just don't rationally make any sense. But I will start things off with a quick rundown of just what the Holodomor was, because one of the unfortunate effects of far-left ideological capture of academia is that many people have not even heard of this genocide, despite it affecting millions of people. And yet it is often only fleetingly mentioned in primary and secondary education. This, in my opinion, may just be as unintentional as the event in question, as it likely stems from embarrassment over the fact that it stands as one of the biggest failures of communist collectivization schemes in modern history. So here we go. The Holodomor is a word used to refer to a genocide that targeted the Ukrainian people in a man-made famine that happened around 1932 to 1933, under the rule of Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union. During this event, roughly 4 million Ukrainians were killed, possibly even more, but also possibly slightly less. That's certainly not anything below 3 million. The main cause of the problem comes from Stalin's farm collectivization policy that took place at this time. This meant that farmers no longer owned their own farms or their land, but rather instead the farms were all collectively owned by the people. But of course, what that phrase actually means in practice really just means central planning, which means the Soviet state essentially owned the farms and got to dictate where the yields went. And if people didn't like what they were doing, then well, the state would just force them to give in at gunpoint. And while most of the Ukrainians died died of starvation, there was in fact a sizable chunk of people who were directly killed or executed, you could say, by Soviet forces for non-compliance. Stalin's farm collectivization policies were an absolute disaster, pretty much. And even without the Holodomor, his failure alone would be a massive blow to the socialist idea that collective ownership is an efficient economic strategy in any way. This led to widespread famine throughout the Soviet Union. However, Ukraine was the hardest hit. By far. Suspiciously far. And this is where things started to get a bit grim. Many Ukrainians strongly opposed Stalin's farm collectivization scheme, and thus within Ukraine there was an ever-growing nationalistic desire to be independent from Russia that's honestly gone back hundreds of years. Or to put it simply, they didn't like the idea of being forced into what was essentially slave labor. Stalin didn't care for this, and so the Soviet Union imposed extremely unrealistic production quotas on them for their farms as a way to basically snuff them out. Once Stalin got word of the famine going on, he instead had the state 
state locked down Ukrainian borders, often forbidding Ukrainians from fleeing or seeking help. Soldiers continued to take what little grain they had to the point where anything that could be classified as food was to be taken from Ukrainian families at gunpoint. Sound familiar here? And this is where a big piece of evidence that it was an intentional genocide rather than just a random famine or just random natural event comes into play. There is solid evidence showing that it was specifically ethnic Ukrainians who were targeted, for instance, one order from Stalin specifically made it so Ukrainians were not allowed to flee the famine, while other groups experiencing famine were allowed to do so. This proves that Stalin not only knew the famine was killing them, but intentionally locked in Ukrainians specifically. This order also shows just how the Soviet government viewed Ukraine. One particular line reads that Ukraine missed that counter-revolutionary undertaking by the enemies of Soviet rule. In other words, many of the Ukrainians were considered reactionaries or kulaks, things considered counter-revolutionary rebellious to the Soviet regime. Another letter further proves this. In 1932, they were more concerned with losing power in Ukraine than they were concerned with Ukrainians dying. This proves that Stalin knew what was happening in Ukraine and viewed the Ukrainians more or less as problem children to be dealt with rather than starving people who needed to be saved. Then, as millions of Ukrainians started to die with the streets often littered with corpses, all that was done for them was, well, more theft of food from starving Ukrainians by the Soviet state, and another big piece of evidence against Stalin, the media blackout. He had the Soviet state media intentionally cover up any and all evidence in regards to what was going on in Ukraine. State-controlled media sources were not even allowed to talk of the famine or use the word famine to even suggest that something was going on. Those who refused to comply were at the very least stripped of their positions, or at worst found dead in extremely suspicious circumstances. This cover-up conspiracy was so effective that it would not be decades later until historical scholars finally started to uncover just what Stalin and the Soviet Union had done to the Ukrainian people. This creates a pretty big problem for the people who wish to claim that what happened to Ukrainians in the 1930s was just another famine, as opposed to being an intentional genocide. To believe that all this wasn't intentional, one must simultaneously believe in Stalin the complete dunderhead and Stalin the genius. Somehow, Stalin was such a pig-headed fool that he was unable to recognize that his policies were killing people despite being told that they were. That he somehow didn't know that locking in Ukrainians specifically and preventing them from fleeing the famine would increase their death toll, and somehow be so completely insane that he didn't understand that taking food from starving Ukrainian families would also kill them. I mean, at the very least, you would think that he would reduce those quotas to a manageable level. And yet, we also have on the other side, Stalin the genius. Despite being dumb enough to do the aforementioned thing, Stalin was somehow smart enough to orchestrate one of the most effective media blackouts in history, as well as hatch a plan that resulted in the Soviets maintaining political control of Ukraine until their collapse in 1991. You also just have to ignore Stalin's obvious motives. Russia has a history with disliking Ukrainians desire for independence that goes back hundreds of years. And there are several documents showing that Stalin was worried about anti-Soviet and collectivization demonstrations and Ukrainian nationalism, crushing them with a famine being a simple, albeit very evil, way for him to get rid of said problem. This is probably why the Holodomor as an intentional genocide has slowly become the historical consensus. Because Stalin's actions just don't really make any sense otherwise, with the most likely explanation of his actions being in answer to what he saw as the Ukrainian question. There are hundreds of things Stalin and the Soviet Union could have done to save the lives of Ukrainians during this famine, but they didn't. Instead, it appears that they did everything they could possibly do to make it worse. And this means that a lot of Holodomor denial arguments boil down to plebit communists saying some really weird stuff that can be easily dismissed just on grounds of basic reason. It's just saying that because they died of starvation, and starvation is a natural cause, it doesn't meet some arbitrary definition of genocide they made up, which requires specific direct actions, such as what took place in the Holocaust. Which is, of course, absolutely absurd and could just be rejected by any rational person. Imagine if you had to choose between being killed by being locked in a gas chamber for a minute, or locked in a box with no food until you starve to death. Just because starvation and dehydration are natural processes of death doesn't change the fact that you are being forced into a situation by an aggressive actor that will inevitably result in death. In fact, if anything, the gas is much quicker and less painful. So if anything, those kind of arguments just further prove how brutal Stalin's regime actually was. Stalin was perfectly fine with killing people in one of the most painful ways possible. However, there are quite a few more arguments out there against the Holodomor as a genocide narrative that are a bit more fleshed out and can even be convincing if you aren't aware of the flaws in their rhetoric or the historical inaccuracies that they're relying on. And so that's what the rest of this video will be focusing on.
The first thing that needs to look at is Bad and Panda's video about the Holodomor and how Wikipedia lies to you about it. Now, this particular video actually starts out with a very good point, something that I've said myself. Wikipedia is not a good source for any highly controversial or subjective topic, since the way the source policy on Wikipedia works makes it so that Wikipedia considers something as true if a mainstream media source simply says so, even if it's just an editorial with little to no evidence to back it up, which is pretty silly, and this is true, this is an actual problem with Wikipedia. Evidence and reason are the things that should determine whether or not something makes it on an encyclopedia, not just because some random person who works for the New York Times or whatever says that something is true. To put it very simply, Wikipedia has an inbuilt appeal to authority problem. Its rules make it so that the site cares more about who is saying something is true than it cares about what evidence has been presented that shows that it's true. Which of course is silly because what a corporate media pundit has to say about some data is obviously less relevant than what said data actually says. Madam Panda then goes on to critique the Wikipedia article on the Holodomor genocide question, and that's where things start to fall apart, because the reasoning he uses to debunk the article is very similar to the flawed, irrelevant reasoning that Wikipedia uses to decide what is and what isn't a reliable source, in that he makes several arguments against a side claiming it was a genocide that have nothing to do with whether or not it was a genocide, and little to do with the actual data itself. There are a lot of pedantic arguments he presents in his hour and a half, so I will just focus on the ones that stand out the most. But for the most part, I found his video to be guilty of something I like to call source midwittery, which is when a scholar's analysis that is being used as a source is getting judged based on some random irrelevant nitpicks. For example, he explains why countries recognizing the Holodomor as a genocide doesn't automatically make it a genocide because governments tend to just adopt what truth is convenient to them, regardless of evidence. Now, to be fair, this is somewhat half true. There are some lies governments can get away with telling and some that they can't, and they usually do tend to say the things that benefit them the most. But that's a completely different topic altogether. Rather, this reasoning becomes a problem because he argues that the Ukrainian government calling it a genocide can't be taken seriously, but for some reason scholars who cite Soviet state propaganda should be taken seriously. And this is just a general problem you often see with commie logic. If the source is data from a socialist state, then it is to be accepted without question, but if the source comes from a non-socialist state, then it's evil imperious Nazi propaganda or something. This is one of the many reasons why talking to communists often feels like you're talking to a wall. And it also also leads to some really irrelevant statements like this one. Chances of governments on matters like these have far more to do with whatever's most politically convenient for them than with them honestly assessing the historical evidence, so they're not exactly reliable sources. For a particularly illustrative example of this, in 2003 and 2008, the Australian Parliament formally passed a resolution recognising the Holodomor as genocide. Yet it's also never actually formally acknowledged its own genocide of Aboriginal people, which there is an overwhelming scholarly consensus supporting. And Australia even rejected the results of a report which the government itself commissioned, which also came to the same conclusion. Okay, so what? So Evil Empire number one supposedly did a bad thing, therefore bad thing by Evil Empire number two either didn't happen or doesn't count, or is somehow less evil because you use the UN definition of genocide instead of the Oxford Dictionary definition or that other definition or some other definition. For instance, he cites the alleged Australian genocide of indigenous people. Whether or not you agree if that was also wrong, what does it matter? It's completely irrelevant. Does it make Stalin starving out the Ukrainians any less evil? No, no it does not. It is completely irrelevant. It is a meaningless tuquoque. The only thing that matters here is whether or not it can be proven that Stalin intentionally caused the death of millions. And of course, the next problem is being nitpicky about definitions. For instance, take a look at this clip. Since the most common definition of genocide, using the UN definition, requires specific intent, he agrees with some other authors that bad policy that didn't turn out the way those implementing it had hoped cannot be considered genocidal by this common definition. He goes on to state that while by his assessment Stalin's actions once the famine was underway, such as instituting a policy to turn back starving peasants fleeing the affected areas, do constitute crimes against humanity, there is nonetheless just not any evidence fitting of the UN definition of genocide for the same reason that we just went over. Elman, however, does believe that there is evidence that the Soviet leadership considered some of the famine's victims to have deserved their fate. 
And this is really just an example of the source itself not being well reasoned out. He mentions that UN definition, so let's take a look at just what the UN considers to be a genocide. Now, the main thing the UN has is a requirement for specific intent to be found that they actually intended to commit a genocide. Then a PDF detailing the genocide convention that the genocide definition is made up of two elements, the physical element or the acts committed and the mental element, the intent. That to constitute genocide, there must be a proven intent on the part of the perpetrators to physically destroy a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. And well, the thing is, what Stalin did does indeed fit this definition. While it's true that there's no evidence of Stalin literally saying, yes, I want millions of Ukrainians to die by my actions, this sets an extremely unreasonable standard. Imagine if in a murder trial you have evidence that the defendant pulled the trigger and had a motive to murder the victim, but a lawyer tried to argue, hmm, well, gee, we can't read my client's mind and prove that he knew pulling the trigger could end the victim's life, so it was actually manslaughter. That's basically the low-level reasoning we are dealing with here. Looking at the evidence shows that Stalin had a motive due to wanting to squash anti-Soviet Union demonstrations in Ukraine and browbeat their national identity away because he was severely concerned with Ukrainian nationalism. And ripping food at gunpoint from people who are already starving to death is clearly an action that any person who does not suffer from severe mental disability can understand to be a death sentence. In other words, to claim that it wasn't a genocide by the UN definition, they are effectively saying, you can't prove that Stalin knew that locking down and stealing food from starving Ukrainians would kill them. Therefore, it wasn't a genocide. So yeah, as it turns out, the little skit I did about bio Biden at the start of this video wasn't actually any kind of exaggeration. This legitimately is the reasoning that is being used. I wish I was joking. So yeah, time to state the obvious. It doesn't matter how much work a scholar has put into studying Soviet history. If the reasoning behind their claim is demonstrably insane, saying they should not be taken seriously. While it may be true that we indeed cannot magically go back in time and magically read Stalin's mind and therefore we cannot know by whatever magical means by this unrealistic empiricist standard of evidence for absolute 100% certainty what the freaking hell Stalin was thinking, this same standard could be applied to any crime to claim it wasn't intentional and it would also be impossible to prove. At some point you have to recognize man as a rational actor and apply some basic common sense and some basic Occam's razor to what they they most likely were intending basic qualitative analysis. Madam Panda seems to double down on this silly reasoning when he attempted to refute the book Bloodlands, completely hand-waving it away as debunked without really going over it at all. So I decided to read what Bloodlands had to say myself. One of the things it pointed out was the blacklist. This was a policy the Soviets put in place where communities in Ukraine that failed to meet their production quotas would then face multiplying quotas, specifically multiplied by 15 times, which of course they had no chance of meeting. And if they failed to meet this impossible standard, then the states took everything from them and barred them from receiving food deliveries, basically condemning them to death. Unless, again, you want to argue that Stalin didn't know that taking food from and multiplying quotas on starving Ukrainians would kill them. Now, to Badam Panda's credit, he does at least recognize that Stalin's policies were disastrous and that the actions within the Soviet government were irresponsible. And thus the fault for at least some of the deaths in the famine was indeed Stalin's fault. Madame Panda is mainly just arguing against it being intentional. There are other tankies out there who are much more pro-Stalinist than him, that try to make absurd arguments that Stalin did nothing wrong and that the famine was caused entirely by disease or other natural causes, despite the lack of solid evidence for this claim and in spite of all the research that has been done into Stalin's actions during this time period that heavily details all the terrible things that he did. So credit does have to be given to Madame Panda for not being as crazy as some of the other tankies. But for the most part, all this video really boils down to is examining the sources used in the 2022 version of the Wikipedia article on the Holodomor genocide question, and pointing out how the sources that stand against the idea that the Holodomor was a genocide tend to have more effort behind them and be more fleshed out than the sources claiming it was, and claiming that the latest research actually claims that it was not a genocide, based on course on data from Soviet archives claiming it wasn't, and that all the sources claiming that it was a genocide are supposedly based on outdated information. In other words, it's an empiricist analysis with almost no rationality applied to it. Now, aside from the rational problems I pointed out, there's an additional problem with this, which is that there actually are books out there that take a closer look at the evidence and conclude it was a genocide that are relatively recent. For instance, one of the sources for my video that you're watching right now is the book Red Famine by Anne Applebaum in 2017, which heavily documents how the genocide was carried out, why it was carried out, and how Soviet propaganda mills covered it up. 
Interestingly, this one is completely missing from the Wikipedia article. Hmm. It's almost as if Wikipedia's source requirements are actually biased against more right-leaning sources. Nah, that couldn't be. So I guess in a fun M. Night Shyamalan twist, he's entirely correct that the Wikipedia article on the Holodomor genocide is biased. Just for the opposite reason he seems to think that it is. Now the next argument I want to look at is Muk Hulak Sabotage. So one video out there that has now been privated was some Holodomor denial from Hakim. Fortunately, Praxpin made a good video response to it, debunking many of its claims before it got taken down. For instance, some of the things Praxpin went over were how the fact that Ukrainians were targeted outside of Ukraine proves that Ukrainians were specifically targeted, and that whether or not Ukrainian nationalism was actually as prevalent as Stalin believed is completely irrelevant to Stalin's motives. He also pointed out the fact that the aid the Soviets did send Ukrainians was nowhere near the amount that the Soviets stole from Ukraine, and was this likely just an act so they could pretend that they were doing something about it when they weren't. He also went into letters found between the Soviets and Stalin that proved that they knew what was going on, which I will include in my sources in the description of this video. And that's a very important one, because again, part of proving the intent part of genocide is showing that they knew exactly what they were doing. But beyond all that, there is one offhand comment that Hakim made that Praxman didn't really touch on, and that is this. If you're not familiar with this narrative, it kind of goes like this. Stalin engineered a famine in order to crush Ukrainian nationalism. Now, this is kind of taken for granted by, well, everybody. It's never really analyzed all too well. And why should it be? If this were disproven, then the entire argument of the famine being man-made would just boil down to Stalin orchestrated this famine just because, which is ridiculous and would lead people to look at other, much more plausible explanations such as massive droughts, wheat rust, sabotage by kulaks, it's sabotage by kulaks, it's sabotage by kulaks, etc, etc. Ah yes. The famine was caused by sabotage by kulaks. This is a really popular argument, especially by young, misinformed Reddit and Twitter communists. It's this idea that the famine was actually caused by the kulaks. This is because people who are denying that Holodomor was the fault of Stalin and the Soviet regime, they need to come up with alternative explanations for the mass deaths of Ukrainians that was finally discovered once the Soviet propaganda mill could no longer hide it. And one of these alternative explanations is of course to blame Kulaks. This is where the victim perception fallacy can be used to understand the silliness of Soviet propaganda. Kulak was a term used against peasants who were somewhat better off than other peasants, specifically being rich enough to hire workers to help with their farms. And you Usually they owned a few more acres of land on average compared to people who weren't initially considered kulaks. The idea put forth by the Soviets was that kulaks were successful because they were victimizing other less successful peasants, that they were reactionaries, and they heavily propagandized this term as a sort of snarl word to be used in their class conflicts, deeming kulaks to be class enemies. And they used this as justification for taking everything from said kulaks, or in some cases just flat out executing them. As the propaganda spread, many Many people in Soviet Russia came to just believe it, and thus kulaks were perceived to be perpetrators of all the evils, while less well-off peasants were perceived to be victims. And of course those victim perceptions were then used and reported by the Soviet government to amplify the effect and the perceptions of victimhood. And while it is true that many who were labeled as kulaks strongly opposed collectivization and participated in anti-Soviet government demonstrations, this is really only because they were against the idea of having everything they worked so hard for taken from them for the sake of a terrible idea. Problem, of course, is that it was all complete nonsense. Kulaks, as they were called, were simply the farmers who were more competent at their job. So if anything, they were the good guys in this story. Rather, their demonization was really just one of the early instances of the silly leftist idea that disparate outcomes imply that something nefarious has taken place. So in their eyes, it couldn't possibly be that Kulaks were simply better or more competent. They must have cheated somehow to get what they had, or gotten their wealth from stealing the workers' must surplus labor value or some similarly silly socialist talking point. The reality is, there is absolutely no evidence that suggests that anything the Kulaks did could have meaningfully caused the famine. That isn't heavily tied to some form of agitprop or other Soviet propaganda wing. Instead, the evidence shows that Kulaks were more or less used as the go-to boogeymen by Stalin's regime to explain away their failures or hide their crimes. Rain quotas not met, blame the Kulaks. Not enough meat? blame the kulaks. Starving peasants fleeing the famine? Yep, they blame the kulaks for that too. Everything was kulaks. 
Unfortunately, the way the victim perception fallacy works is that the more people who buy into it, the more bogus data is generated and it becomes impossible to tell that it's bogus data unless you realize what's going on. And so, of course, the propaganda became very successful. And eventually, anyone deemed to be an enemy of the Soviet government for whatever reason was then labeled by them as a kulak because, hey, it's successful propaganda. Might as well just call anyone we don't like to be a kulak. So now we got people being called kulaks regardless of whether or not they were even wealthy enough to meet the original definition of kulak, which resulted that a lot of Ukrainian peasants who were just as poor as everyone else now being labeled as a bourgeois kulaks just for the crime of wrong think and nothing more. Now as for whether or not or how far kulaks can be blamed for the famine, it is true that there is some evidence to suggest that some farmers decided to burn their own crops and slaughter their own livestock instead of giving in to collectivization. Problem is, this doesn't really matter for two reasons. For one, there's no evidence, again, outside of Soviet propaganda that the amount of food destroyed by kulaks comes anywhere close to the amount of food needed to be taken away out of the Soviet economy to be a large contributor to the famine. And two, it legitimately does not matter because the crops burned and livestock slaughtered were about to be taken away from Ukraine anyways. And because of the way farm collectivization works, the central planners, aka the Soviet Communist Party, got to decide where the farm produce went. And, uh, spoiler alert, it wasn't going back to the Ukrainians anyways. So to blame kulaks for the Ukrainian famine because they torched food that wasn't even going to be used for Ukrainians, it's just silly. It's just obviously really, really silly. And again, you just have the general problem of trust. Can any Soviet source be trusted on this matter at all? Considering how much propaganda was used to demonize the kulaks and how far they went to cover it up, and how much data about alleged kulak wrongthink was likely overblown by them by the victim perception fallacy, it's likely that their actions had little to no impact at all. If anything, it was dekulakization that greatly contributed to the famine, since kulaks were often the more competent grain producers, demonizing and getting rid of them through deportation, executions, and or imprisonments, likely led to a form of competency crisis where the farmers who actually knew what they were doing were then harder to come by. Therefore, it was actually Stalin's demonization of kulaks that made the Ukrainian famine worse, not the actions of the kulaks trying to resist his policies. So now, the next lie I want to go over is the idea that the Holodomor is nothing more than a myth that was born from evil Nazi propaganda. So, as is customary in extreme far-left circles to blame everything they don't like on Nazis, it should come as no surprise that another very popular argument among commies trying to deny the Holodomor is to claim that the entire thing is just one big hoax by Ukrainian Nazis, or just Nazis in general. The argument is basically that Ukrainian nationalists made the whole thing up and fabricated evidence as a way to gain support for Ukrainian independence from Soviet Russia, and also, they're all Nazis. This is made more interesting by the fact that Ukrainian Nazis are what the Russian government is currently using as their main justification for their current modern-day invasion of Ukraine. And the Kremlin currently pushes out tons and tons of propaganda that Ukraine in general is entirely a Nazi nation. Now, before I even get into this, I just have to point out the obviously ridiculous contradiction here. When looking at things from the historical points, Holodomor deniers will often try to claim that Ukrainian nationalism wasn't actually that big of a deal, and thus it can't really be considered as a real motive behind Stalin's actions, that Stalin's worry over it cannot be taken seriously as a part of his motive for carrying out the genocide. But on the flip side, the deniers will then immediately switch this up and try to say that the Ukrainian nationalists are powerful, influential enough, and major enough within Ukraine that they were able to pass off a genocide hoax. So are the Ukrainian nationalists a problem, or are they not? really activates the elements, doesn't it? Anyways, the entire argument is really just a combination of various association fallacies and taking certain historical facts out of context, as well as just blatantly false accusations. This is then used to hand wave away any evidence that comes from Ukraine or has any association in any way with Ukraine as, again, Nazi propaganda by definition. For example, if you look up any commie response to any video that uses Red Famine as a source like this one, they will usually claim that it's from Ukrainian Nazis. And maybe perhaps also link Mark Tauger, seething and it picking the book because he is mad that it refutes his life work. Whatever. So sad. Which, by the way, is another trick the commies will often do. They will cite Mark Tauger's work as if he is a one-man academic consensus on the subject, when in reality he is just one voice on the matter in a sea of thousands who mostly disagree with him. As for the Nutsi accusations, well, it's all nonsense, of course. For starters, Anne Applebaum most certainly is not a Nutsi. Basic research into her political views reveals her to be an extremely generic Clinton liberal who has 
openly spoken out against nationalist political parties several times. And this should really surprise absolutely no one. False accusations of being a Nutsi is a far leftoid tactic that has been going on for over half a century. This is why it is entirely reasonable to just, well, flat out assume that any such accusations from a socialist or any sort is a lie until they can manifest solid evidence. The accusation that she got her data from Ukrainian Nutsis is similarly unsubstantiated, and seems to be based more or less on Russian propaganda that any and all Ukrainians are Nutsis by association with Azov, which is of course just a fallacy of composition. Most Ukrainians are not Azov, and even then Azov is mostly just a far-right group, and there is certainly no evidence whatsoever of them fabricating evidence about the Holodomor to push Ukrainian nationalism. And it's also all completely irrelevant to the book Red Famine and Anne Applebaum. Her main funding actually came from James C. Timurdy, who is a Canadian Ukrainian who founded Northland Power. He is also known for his philanthropy, including being the primary sponsor of the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter. Yeah. In other words, pretty safe to say that this guy is also, surprise surprise, not a Nutsi. Applebaum's sources are also a diverse combination of Ukrainian archives, pictures, testimony, and a variety of publicly available works from other scholars. Again, no evidence of Nutsi tampering. And again, this really shouldn't be all that surprising. In general, when a commie tells you that a source can't be trusted because ma Nutsis, they are lying to you. It is only for the sake of making sure my video was factually accurate did I double check all this to ensure that the accusations were indeed false. But for simplicity's sake, if if you ever short on time and you're talking to a comic or listening or whatever, you can always safely assume that these kind of accusations are always completely made up when coming out of their mouths. Said false accusations have also been going on for a very long time and are not unique to Anne Applebaum's work. In fact, she actually touched on other attempts to push this narrative by talking about the book Publication of Fraud, Famine, and Fascism, the Ukrainian Genocide Myth from Hitler to Harvard, writing that his book describes the famine as a hoax invented and propagated by Ukrainian fascists and anti-Soviet groups in the West. He also made the completely absurd implication that Ukrainian diaspora were all Nutsis. Again, using a guilt by association fallacy. In general, Douglas Toddle's work is not taken seriously by anyone outside of Soviet apologists, and the book is widely considered to be discredited. The irony, of course, in all of this is that it's the association with Nutsis that is in fact Russian propaganda. What's actually going on here is that the Kremlin will cherry pick a few examples like Stepan Bandera or someone, who did indeed work with the German National Socialists with the belief that doing so would benefit Ukraine, and then use that to generate that all of Ukraine is a Nutsi nation because of that one guy. Therefore, they are justified in invading Ukraine in a denutsification campaign, and also the Holodomor didn't happen because Ukrainians are Nutsis, and so their testimony evidence that it did happen is therefore Nutsi propaganda. That's actually just all Russian propaganda. Another trick that the propagandists will try to pull on this one is an equivocation fallacy, where they'll define all Ukrainians who don't want Ukraine to be independent from Russia as being nationalists and equate this to being Nutsis, and then of course from there they will try to make the additional logical leap that, oh well, they're all Nutsis, therefore everything they say is false. Woo, hello to more didn't happen. It's all nothing more than a big giant game of lies and wordplay gymnastics. This doesn't excuse Ukraine entirely. The country does have problems, and it does have a very big history of corruption, and it certainly doesn't mean that we should be sending billions of dollars in aid to them in said current invasion. However, the claims that they fabricated the Holodomor because they're a Nutsi nation or whatever is completely unsubstantiated. It is nothing more than a deranged cope that is circulated around in various internet communist forums, Twitter, and Discord servers, where their essential argument is that Ukraine is lying about the Holodomor because the Kremlin and other sources that are playing up Pelogia for the Soviet regime say so, and also something something one guy who died several decades ago was a Nutsi in Ukraine, therefore all of Ukraine is Nutsi. It's ridiculous. The whole thing is very silly. Fortunately, the claims are easily disproven as the accusations, when they're actually verifiable, always turn out to either be completely false or, again, just silly generalizations. But anyways, it's now time for the conclusion. Well, making this video took longer than most of my other videos because I spend a lot of time looking through various sources that communist tankies would cite. What I personally found was that their entire argument against Flotimore is nothing more than one giant gift gallop of sources to obfuscate the fact that all they're really doing is indirectly citing Soviet propaganda. On that note, I would like to make the recommendation that anyone interested in learning more read at least chapter 14 of Red Famine on the cover-up. It heavily details the great lengths that the Soviets went to prevent the word from getting out in regards to what they had done. There's even evidence that shows they went as far as to fudge census numbers, which is pretty hard dedication on covering things up. The reason I suspect many people deny or downplay the Holodomor is simply because people do not want to accept the reality that left 
leftist economic policies require an empowered central planner, and that this inevitably leads to a situation where if and when the people with said power decide to abuse it, they can very easily use it, that authority to attempt to snuff out people who dissent to their regime as a way to maintain their power. And while many of these people are just useful idiots, honestly, who are drunk on the mu equality Kool-Aid, there is not a doubt in my mind that some of them know exactly what they are doing, and they want you to forget about this event so that they can have the chance to do it again. But beyond that, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to tip me on Ko-Fi, or like, or subscribe, or just leave a comment. Till next time.